So hello, my name is Professor Diane Berry and I'm Dean of the Postgraduate Research Studies. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this year's doctoral research conference. Now normally I'd be doing this standing in a large lecture theatre packed full of eager doctoral students, but sadly this year it's just not possible due to our COVID restrictions. However, I can still promise you a really stimulating time listening to our talented doctoral researchers. So one of the key aims of the Graduate School is to help our doctoral researchers from across the university connect with each other as part of a thriving research community. And today's conference has just that aim. But we're also here to celebrate the excellence, originality and importance of our doctoral research. So today we'll be showcasing this in a number of ways. You'll be hearing from our four finalists of our PhD Researcher of the Year competition. And of course, we have our very popular three minute thesis competition. And today you'll be hearing from our seven shortlisted finalists. You'll also have an opportunity to view an online gallery of the entries to our Research Life and Image competition and we'll be announcing the winners of all of those competitions later in the conference today. So I think that's enough for me for now. We're going to start the conference hearing from our first two finalists for the PhD Researcher of the Year Award. The Researcher of the Year competition recognises and celebrates the achievements of an outstanding doctoral researcher. Each research division nominates a candidate and the four research deans select the winner for each of the four research themes. Our two Pro Vice Chancellors for Research and Innovation then select the overall winner. So our first finalist is Christopher Evans from the School of Law and he's representing the research theme of prosperity and resilience. His research examines the implications of the recently adopted Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. I'm delighted to be nominated as the Prosperity and Resilience Research Theme candidate for the PhD Research of the Year Award. And I'd like to express my thanks to my supervisors and the School of Law for their nomination and support too. So probably everyone listening in today will be aware that in August 1945, the United States dropped two nuclear explosive devices over the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, resulting in the loss of between 110 and 210,000 lives. To this day, the damage caused by these events, in addition to the more than 2,000 nuclear weapon tests conducted, continue to impact affected individuals and the environment. Pictured is the Runnet Dome, a concrete tomb constructed by the US containing the radioactive waste from nuclear weapon testing in the Marshall Islands. Recent reports have raised concerns that rising sea levels as a result of climate change is causing radioactive material from the dome to leak into the nearby lagoon. Since the end of the Second World War, the international community of states has tried to address the dangers posed by nuclear weapons. In January 1946, the very first resolution of the newly formed United Nations General Assembly called for the elimination from national armaments of atomic weapons. Later, in 1968, the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, or NPT, was adopted, under which the nuclear weapon states of the time, the United States, Russia, China, France and the UK, committed to pursue negotiations in good faith on effective measures relating to nuclear disarmament. But 50 years on, this commitment remains unfulfilled. There are now nine nuclear weapon states which collectively possess around 13,000 nuclear weapons. And perhaps most significantly, in contrast to chemical and biological weapons, the use of nuclear weapons has not previously been prohibited by states under international law. This conclusion was similarly shared by the International Court of Justice in the infamous 1996 Nuclear Weapons Advisory Opinion. However, in July 2017, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the so-called Ban Treaty, was adopted by 122 states at the United Nations and entered into force in January 2021. The Ban Treaty represents the first global agreement to comprehensively prohibit nuclear weapons and includes provisions aimed at facilitating the elimination of nuclear weapons too. Its adoption has been hailed by the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez 
as an important step and contribution towards the common aspiration of a world without nuclear weapons. The International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons was awarded the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize in recognition of its efforts to achieve the conclusion of the Ban Treaty. However, the Ban Treaty has resulted in polarised response from states. While its supporters concede that the treaty will not lead to the elimination of nuclear weapons in the near term, they claim it will contribute towards the delegitimization of nuclear weapons and create pressure on the nuclear weapon states to renew their disarmament efforts. In effect, the Ban Treaty is just the first but important step towards a world free from nuclear weapons. However, none of the nuclear weapon states participated in, nego in the negotiations, and on the day of the treaty's adoption, the UK, US and France issued a joint statement declaring that they do not intend to sign, ratify or ever become party to it. Given that a central principle of international law is that a treaty will not bind a state without its consent, various commentators have questioned the significance and impact of the Ban Treaty. My research ultimately seeks to offer a response and some answers to these concerns, and aims to provide one of the first comprehensive assessments of the Ban Treaty's current impact, influence and contribution to the international nuclear disarmament legal regime. This allows me to answer the underlying question in my research, does the Nuclear Ban Treaty offer a viable framework that is capable of revitalising nuclear disarmament efforts? And this question is answered in two connected ways. To begin with, I analyse the Ban Treaty's articles and disarmament related provisions from a largely doctrinal perspective. First, I examine the prohibitions established by Article 1 and demonstrate how the Ban Treaty expands upon and strengthens existing restrictions on nuclear weapons related activities established by early agreements including the 1968 MPT. Next, I assess the content and nature of the disarmament provisions of the Ban Treaty established by Article 4, through which nuclear weapon states can join the treaty. They can either disarm then join, or join then disarm according to a legally binding plan to be negotiated with a presently unidentified authority. I show that this creates a useful framework which outlines how disarmament will proceed, while leaving the specific details concerning verification to be determined in due course with the involvement of nuclear weapon states. And finally, I engage with, and in many cases dismiss, various common criticisms raised against the Ban Treaty by its opponents, including claims that the Ban Treaty undermines and competes with existing nuclear weapons treaties, that the Ban Treaty undermines nuclear deterrent security arrangements, and that the treaty contains weak verification provisions. Next, my research then turns to examine what impact the Ban Treaty can be seen as having in practice so far. Here I explore the influence of the treaty within international disarmament forums to determine whether the nuclear weapon states are changing their rhetoric towards the treaty, whether it has created a renewed interest in nuclear disarmament negotiations, and whether it has in practice disrupted existing nuclear weapons related treaties, specifically the MPT. Next, I examine recent divestment from nuclear weapons producing companies by financial institutions, in part due to the underlying humanitarian ideals of the Ban Treaty. And finally, I explore the question of whether the Ban Treaty could, over time, contribute to the development of any customary international law prohibitions on the use of nuclear weapons. If this can be shown, this could theoretically extend the prohibition established under Article 1 to all states, regardless of whether they have joined the Ban Treaty. So ultimately, my research shows that while the Ban Treaty reinforces and, and strengthens existing restrictions on nuclear weapons related activities and provides a useful framework to advance nuclear disarmament, its impact and influence has been fairly limited so far. What may therefore be needed is time for the treaty to develop further and generate greater stigma surrounding nuclear weapons. I've been fortunate to have experienced many highlights throughout my PhD journey at Reading. I applied for and was awarded funding by the AHRC South, West and Wales Doctoral Training Partnership to carry out this research in August 2018. My work has also been cited by the House of Lords International Relations Committee in a report published in 2019. I've also had the wonderful opportunity to participate and present my research virtually at the 2020 Cambridge International Law Conference and seminars organised by the School of Law. But undoubtedly my most memorable achievement have been the publication of my research in leading peer-reviewed journals, including the Melbourne Journal of International Law and the Journal of Conflict and Security Law. 
As postgraduate researchers, we spend our time endlessly reading, experimenting with ideas and writing in the hope that one day our research can be published in leading journals with which we each become familiar. To be able to say I've achieved this is something I never expected to happen when I first joined Reading as an undergraduate back in 2013. Thank you. So our second finalist for the PhD Researcher of the Year Award is Maze Ifliel from the School of Pharmacy and she's representing the theme of agriculture, food and health. She'll be explaining how her research aims to develop a model of insulin infusion use in hospitals. Hi. I am pleased to be nominated as the Agriculture, Food and Health Research Team candidate. My research focused on understanding safety differently in the context of intravenous insulin infusion. Let's go through a journey in our bodies to understand how insulin works. After you eat, your intestines break down carbohydrates from food into sugar. That sugar goes into your bloodstream, which makes your blood sugar level rise. Your pancreas is an organ that sits just behind your stomach. It releases insulin to control the level of sugar in your blood. Insulin then helps the sugar to move into cells to use it for energy. However, if the pancreas fails to produce sufficient quantities of insulin, too much sugar, which is called hyperglycemia, will remain in the blood and may require hospitalization. The treatment of choice for hospitalized patients who are very unwell due to hyperglycemia and are not able to eat by mouth is to give them intravenous insulin infusions. Insulin infusions are effective in controlling elevated blood sugar, but this medication can cause serious harm to patients if used incorrectly. Because of that, various initiatives have been introduced to improve the safety of using insulin infusions, such as using guidelines to treat elevated blood glucose and using pre-filled ready to administer insulin syringes to reduce preparation errors. The initiatives in the previous slide focus mainly on errors, which is the black dot on the figure. Then they try to find actions and solutions to prevent their future recurrence. Yet, major initiatives to establish patient safety have not demonstrated convincing reductions in risk, error, or death. It is clear that things go right, which is the white area, is much more often than they go wrong. Although it is necessary to understand what goes wrong, there is a big value to be learned from what goes right. So, an emerging approach called resilient healthcare focuses on a comprehensive learning by exploring everyday work that results in both successes and failures. The aim of resilient healthcare is to help transition to a more adaptive organization which has the ability to learn, respond, monitor, and anticipate. To understand how complex is the use of insulin infusions in hospitals, the resilient healthcare approach was used as the theoretical framework that underpins my research. My research composed of three phases. Phase one was understanding how people assume or think themselves and others use insulin infusions, and it was called work as imagined. To understand work as imagined, all insulin infusion guidelines were analyzed and the three different focus group discussions with guideline developers, managers and healthcare practitioners were conducted to explore how insulin infusions were imagined to be used. Phase two explored how work was actually done by healthcare practitioners, which is called work has done. This phase was conducted by video recording all tasks done while using insulin infusions. And for phase two, 
I used a method called video reflexive ethnography where I spent time in familiarizing myself with workplace and then observing healthcare practitioners while using insulin infusions. Then I conducted virtual reflexive meetings using Microsoft Teams with the practitioners to watch themselves and discuss the video footage of their work. The innovation of using this method resides in understanding the context of research setting by paying attention to the invisible but necessary practices that are taken for granted because we use them every day. The third phase was a comparison, a comparison between phase one and phase two in order to develop a model that describes how insulin infusions were used and to devise recommendations and solutions to improve patient safety. I used a task analysis technique called hierarchical task analysis to understand and analyze phase one and two. In order to develop a hierarchical task analysis, an overall goal and sub-goals were determined. Then sub-goals were broken down until an appropriate operation was reached. The comparison between work as imagined and work as done revealed that most of the tasks in the work as done were aligned with those described by participants in the work as imagined. However, Others, which are highlighted in orange, were not done as imagined. For example, in the hospital guidelines, it is important to stop all other diabetes medications when, given to, when we are giving intravenous insulin infusion to the patient. The misalignment was found when the doctor did not suspend other diabetes medications when prescribed intravenous insulin to the patient. Using the findings from phase one and phase two and the comparison output, I developed a model for the use of insulin infusion in the study site. This model gave a clear understanding of how insulin infusions were used, the outcomes and the feedback loops that could be used to realign between work as imagined and work as done. Finally, I would like to conclude with main highlights and achievements of my PhD. First, the study findings have been disseminated to different audiences and were presented at 10 national and international conferences, seminars and workshops. The study presentation also won the prize of the most energetic and enthusiastic presentation at the Ergonomics and the Human Factors Doctoral Consortium in 2018. This PhD resulted in five papers. Three were published in peer-reviewed journals. The fourth and fifth papers are under review. Study findings, including those relating to challenges faced by healthcare practitioners and recommendations for enhancing safety in the use of insulin infusions, were shared with the guideline developers in their annual meeting to update the guidelines, uh, insulin guidelines. Uh, a report of the study findings and the model of insulin infusion uh, use will be shared also with the hospital site. Finally, I had a great collaboration with Oxford University Hospitals personnel to design and conduct the research at the study site, as well as with the methodology advisor from King's College London to use the ref video reflexive methodology in my research. Thank you very much. So thank you to Christopher and Mays for those two very interesting presentations. We'll be hearing from the other two finalists after our three-minute thesis competition. As I said in previous years, the three-minute thesis competition not only showcases the wide range of doctoral research we have across the university, but it also highlights a vital skill that postgraduate researchers need to develop. And this is to be able to describe your research clearly and succinctly to a non-specialist audience. Today, we'll be hearing from our seven shortlisted finalists who have just three minutes to describe their research. They're only allowed one PowerPoint slide and no other props. We're going to start by listening to the first set of speakers now.
since the dawn of science, it's incredible how much we've learned about life and living processes. But it's even more astonishing to realize how much we still don't know. But why? Because life is incredibly complex. If we want to understand a living process, often we have to simplify it, isolate it somehow to study it, which can be extremely challenging, even impossible sometimes. In order to help with this, we have been studying so-called biomimetic materials for many years now. These are artificial materials that are non-living, but they behave like living tissues or organisms. They mimic biological processes. In my project, I work with such a biomimetic material. It's a gel substance, like a wobbly jelly dessert. Uh, this gel has the special ability to behave like the heart. When you have large pieces, you can see that there's a pulsating pattern that is traveling on the surface, similarly to how an ECG signal is traveling the heart. On the other hand, if you take small pieces, they beat like individual heart cells. My research aims to understand the underlying mechanism in detail behind this. There's an ongoing chemical reaction, which is periodically repeating. You can actually see this because the gel changes color between uh, dark red and light greenish red back and forth. This chemical process then starts a mechanical process. The gel expands and contracts rhythmically like the heartbeat, and this is purely a result of the physical chemical interactions. A question arises naturally here. Is this gel really like the heart or is it just similar? The answer is yes, it's much more than just similarity. In my experiments, I managed to show that you can teach this non-living gel to beat in time with an external signal, just like a pacemaker can be implanted to have a patient who has arrhythmia. The comparison comes from this. In each individual heart cell, and between billions of these cells, actually, you can find the same sort of chemical, mechanical, and electrical processes that are periodically repeating, and they keep interacting in an endlessly complex, interconnected system. Both the living heart and the non-living gel develop these periodic processes due to the same underlying physical chemical laws. So when I study my gel, I really study the heart too in an abstract way. The more we learn about this gel, the more we are going to know about the heart too and potentially could help with important research in the future like developing treatments for cardiac disease or who knows, even build an artificial heart. Films exaggerate, imitate, and enrich real-life experiences. They convey stories, they make us laugh and cry. For me, films have become something a lot more than just an art form. I'm a film editor, but I also spent over five years at the university researching the intricacies of the craft, so I decided it was high time I looked at editing through the perspective of both a practitioner and a scholar. Editing is one of the most underappreciated forms in the filmmaking process. Maybe because it goes completely unnoticed to the audience sometimes, or maybe because it's hidden in the production process. But let me show you that there are so many amazing things that editing can actually do. Let's take a look at this collage which I created and which was inspired by Hitchcock's 1964 talk in the Telescope TV show. So here we can see a young man squinting, then he looks at a woman with a baby and smiles. In an effect, he's a kind man. In the other example, picture of a woman with a baby is replaced by a hot lady in a bikini. The guy smiles and, as Hitchcock suggests, what is he now? He's a dirty man. This is called Kulishow effect, which suggests that two images in a sequence are more impactful than a single shot in isolation. So what is it exactly that editors do? How is editing knowledge shared and communicated? How does theory investigate practice and how does practice inform theory? This project will look at different discourses around film editing in order to make useful connections between them, but also to try and identify some of the problematic areas and potential knowledge gaps. This study pays a very special attention to practice-led theoretical thinking, which originates from film editors' interviews and writings. My attempt to conduct my own interviews with film editors will suggest a very important move towards a closer dialogue between the practitioners and the academia. 
Did you know, for instance, that one of the editing strategies in the famous Twilight Saga New Moon was to present some shots of Edward Cullen in a slow mode to represent his vampire sexuality and attractiveness, while the werewolf shots were presented in normal mode to introduce them as alternative supernatural creatures? How exciting is this? And this is just one of the very few interesting insights that I learned from my interviews. As the main element of my practice and research, I'll be conducting a series of audiovisual film essays, which are mainly desktop type detailed film breakdowns. These video essays will allow me to critically reflect on and evaluate those film editing strategies that are difficult to explain in text. This project will offer an updated clarification on what is editing. I will also try and investigate the variations in which different scholars and practitioners review the clarity and the value that editing experience provides. This project is not only a very useful resource for film students, but I'm sure it will also enrich the artistic practices of the filmmakers. I will try to open up a very interesting conversation on film editing to a wider audience to celebrate the role of film editors as key creative elements in the filmmaking practice. Do you know about 2.5 million people die each year due to high blood pressure and associated cardiovascular diseases? Can you guess the main reason behind it? It's salt. Salt is one of the biggest contributors to increased blood pressure and it is present in majorly every food you eat. You buy about 65% of the salt from the supermarkets in the form of processed foods, breads and even breakfast cereals and pay for about 25% of the salt in the meals you eat at the restaurants. And the remaining 10% comes from other sources, including the meals you cook at home. Have you ever thought about your daily salt levels? Data shows an average adult consumes about 9 to 12 grams of salt per day, which is way more than the recommended limit of 5 grams per day. Researchers, policymakers, and manufacturers are working hard in reducing the salt levels, but it is not as easy as it sounds. Salt plays a key role in the textural, microbiological, and sensorial aspects of the food. That means reducing the salt will not only make the food go bad more quickly, it will also make the food less appealing in both taste and texture. Therefore, no current researchers are able to sufficiently reduce the salt levels. We all know eating green leafy vegetables is good for our health. But do you know the reason why? It is because of the fiber, vitamins, minerals and amino acid content in it. Now, can you imagine getting out salt from your salad leaves? Yes, you heard me right. My research is on a plant known as salicornia or samphire, which is consumed as salad in several countries across the world. It grows on the wetlands and marshes, but it does not simply mean that it absorbs the salty seawater. It, it, has an, it contains naturally good balance between amino acids and minerals like potassium, calcium, iodine, zinc, and naturally contains 40% less sodium than normal table salt. Researchers have shown the effectiveness of mineral-based salts and the role of amino acids like lysine in enhancing the perception of saltiness. Therefore, my research is trying to understand how the naturally present amino acids and minerals in this plant are affecting the salty taste and how can we convert this plant into powdered salt without destroying the useful components and further use this powdered salt to substitute normal table salt in your food so that you can enjoy your food without compromising on the taste and health. Have you ever thought about buying medicines from the internet? Did you know that 96% of all global online pharmacies are operating illegally and Millions of fake medicines available online by those illegal online pharmacies have been detected and seized in the past few years. Now, the internet provides a platform for both legal and illegal suppliers of medicines, which are sometimes difficult to distinguish between. Therefore, people might put themselves at risk of buying fake medicines that provided to them by those illegal suppliers. 
This disturbing trend is considered a very serious problem, especially when we know that those fake medicines might be toxic or even life-threatening. And according to one estimate by the World Health Organization in 2019, fake medicines kill hundreds of thousands of people globally every year. Despite the abundance of the governmental campaigns that educate the patient about the danger of the fake medicines available online, people still inadvertently buy fake medicines online. And according to an estimate by the UK government, 1 in 10 people in the UK have bought fake medical products online in 2019. Based on the previous talk, this research aims to answer the question, why do people end up buying fake medicines online? Or in other words, this research aims to find the factors that drive people to end up buying fake medicines from the internet. To achieve the objectives of this research, a three phases study will be conducted. The first phase is the newspaper articles analysis, and this phase aims to build an initial map of ideas about why people end up buying fake medicines online. As this under-researched issue has been highlighted by many newspaper articles in the past few years. However, the results of this phase will need to be proven as the newspaper articles might be inaccurate or might considered as an informal source of data. Therefore, a semi-structured interview will be conducted with the participants having ob opinions and views about the research topic. And this represents phase two of this study. In phase three, the final phase, a questionnaire study will be conducted to generalize the study results and to collect a countrywide views about the reasons why people end up buying fake medicines online. In conclusion, this research will reveal the factors that drive people to end up buying fake medicines from the internet, which in turn could provide the basis for the future campaigns for changing and controlling the purchasing of fake medicines online. So a big thank you to all of those speakers and you'll be hearing from the remaining ones shortly. But before this, you have an opportunity to view the images in our online image gallery. 13 doctoral students submitted entries that either depicted their um, daily PhD life or focused on a particular aspect of their research. And you have a chance to see those images now.
And now it's time for me to announce the winner of the Research Life and Image competition. And this year's winner is a spike in numbers. Congratulations, Abby. We're now going to hear from our final set of shortlisted speakers for the three minute thesis competition. Why water boils at 100 degrees and methane at minus 161? Why blood is red and grass green? Why diamond is hard and wax soft? Why glacier flow and iron gets hot when you harmor it? The answer to all these problems have come from the structural analysis, and that's how the Nobel Prize winner, Max Perutz, summed up X-ray crystallography. Never heard of it? Don't worry, not many people have. And yes, it's one of the greatest innovations of the 20th century. 28 Nobel Prizes have been awarded to projects related to crystallography. Impressive, isn't it? It's now 100 years since the first structure has been determined. But today the work hasn't stopped. Crystallography remains the gold standard technique for working out the atomic structures of almost anything, which is extremely useful for finding out why things behave the way they do. Why an enzyme works the way it does. Why DNA coils the way it does. Why superconductors have zero electrical resistance and how the drug binds to a receptor in human body. And it's even reaching beyond our planet. The Curiosity rover right now is performing the X-ray diffraction analysis of the soil on Mars. But there's plenty of unfinished business here back on Earth and a lot more problems to solve. For instance, 3D structures are very important in the area for the pharmaceutical development, but only when single crystals are grown. But they can't always be grown from powdered pharmaceuticals that companies work with. I aim, in my work, to enable 3D structures to be determined routinely from such powdered pharmaceuticals, to facilitate the movement of new and exciting compounds towards market specifically in my case of opioids, which are very important in the area of pain management. The best method to characterize these materials is powder extra diffraction technique. It is extremely challenging due to the overlap of the reflections, as you can see from the slide. However, it offers the route to 3D structure in the absence of single crystals. Put very bluntly, a powered X-ray experiment gives about 100 times less information than its gold standard equivalent, single crystal experiment. Thus, the challenge of my work is to co overcome this information deficit in a reliable and routine way to still give researchers high quality structures. I will mix experiment, theory and computation in order to achieve this goal. Thank you very much for your attention, stay safe and remember that the world would be a very different place today if there was no X-ray crystallography. The definition of insanity is often quoted as doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And yet when it comes to women's roles in agriculture and food production, history shows us that we are skirting the edge of that very insane notion that women couldn't or shouldn't be involved in a field they have always been involved in, albeit silently. In the United Kingdom, no period in history shows the dichotomy of women's agricultural prowess better than the period pre and post World War II, where hairdressers and secretaries took to the fields to produce the nation's food basket. I focused on key political, educational, and scientific policies of the period to find out what agricultural and food production employment opportunities women had and compared it to modern opportunities for women farmers. This was accomplished by oral history interviews and reading journals from the women themselves, by reviewing images and advertisements, by tracking educational enrollment and certification exams, and through census data research. From this, we find that girls as young as 17 could be found plowing fields under threat of enemy fire, or milking cows for shipment to cities across the nation. They undertook men's work and were nicknamed the Amazon women, felling trees and testing scientific breakthroughs in new laboratories on everything from the nutrition of cheese to pasteurization of milk. 
It's no wonder that by the post-war period, the attempt to force women back into their pre-war homemaker roles was coming under increasing pressure from the women themselves, who, having tasted freedom, were loath to give it up. They had become square pegs, struggling against round holes. A trend which has continued to this day, though the subtle bias against women agriculture workers and owners is less pronounced than in the 1950s and 60s, we still find that less than 20% of sole owners and managers of farms are female, even though 60% of all agricultural students are. The ethnographic stories of the past tell us of POWs being treated with more dignity than Black Britons, and girls being treated as babysitters instead of valued employees, stories that sound awfully familiar to national newscasts of today, and are the reason for the final outputs of this research a best practice guide for politicians, and a curriculum on women in agriculture for educators. My hope being that both will shine light on the vast experience women have to offer. As we look forward, we need to understand that women not only want to be involved, but have the training and experience to operate farms at all scales. What we need to do next is dismantle the cultural barriers in place, mitigate familial concerns that block access to farm ownership and management, and make use of this very valuable resource, our women and girls. Only then can we truly be equal. Only then can our voices truly be heard. Have you ever heard about plant-based eggs? I guess some of you might have seen some examples of plant-based meat at your local grocery shop, but how about plant-based eggs. Plant-based eggs are alternative to conventional eggs that are made from plants such as for example peas, mung beans and soy through processes of protein isolation or fermentation. There are several prototypes of plant-based eggs available such as the liquid plant-based eggs, the powder plant-based eggs and the egg-shaped plant-based eggs. All of these prototypes are yet unavailable in most countries worldwide. However, if they will become widely accessible to consumers, they might heavily impact the egg industry by either competing with conventional eggs or even fully replacing the consumption of eggs in the long run. Therefore, the first aim of my PhD thesis was to find out what the current egg market think about plant-based eggs by hearing the voices of egg industries and retailers. In addition to the market, it is important to remember that consumers will have the final word. They will determine whether plant-based eggs will be successful. Despite the growing demand of plant-based meat alternatives in the past years, most of these products failed to meet consumers' expectations when they were launched into the market. Past research showed that consumers find plant-based meat alternatives being poor in taste and appearance compared to conventional meat. Therefore, the second aim of my PhD thesis was to explore what are consumers' expectations, preferences and needs for plant-based eggs in order for plant-based eggs manufacturers to develop a product that is in line with consumers' expectations. The questions that I tried to answer were, do the consumers like plant-based eggs? What do they expect from the color? What do they expect from the packaging, from the price? Consumers from Italy and the United Kingdom were interviewed in my study, as Italy and the UK are two of the biggest egg markets in the European region. The information gathered by my PhD thesis will be important not only for plant-based egg manufacturers, but also for policymakers who are engaging in the promotion of healthier and more sustainable eating by promoting the consumption of food products that are better for our health and our planet. So a big thank you to all of our three minute thesis speakers this afternoon. I'm now going to hand over to a member of the judging panel who's going to announce the winner. Thank you. I'm Caroline Knowles and I'm Head of Research Communications at the University and I was delighted to be on the panel which assessed the competition. It's always very enjoyable to listen to the presentations and this year there was a strong shortlist. 
the films conveyed the sophistication of the research you're all undertaking and also a real sense of everyone's passion and commitment to their subject. I'm delighted to announce that the winner this year is Tunde Gea Herzig. Tunde impressed us with her presentation on jelly biology and the quest for an artificial heart. She explained her work and its application very clearly and she had a very engaging personal style of presentation. Congratulations Tunde, well done. Right, so we're back to our PhD Researcher of the Year competition. And our third finalist for this competition is Simon Lee from the Department of Meteorology. And he's representing the environment research theme. I'm pleased to be nominated as the environment theme candidate this year. Now, predicting the weather several weeks ahead has large potential socio-economic benefits arising from adequate forewarning of extreme weather, such as flooding, like what we saw in winter 2020, or severe cold. And an example of the latter is the so-called beast from the east in early 2018, which led to the UK's coldest March day on record. So, can we give warning of these events weeks before they occur? That's the focus of my PhD, working closely with the S2S Prediction Project, a major international effort to improve our ability to understand and predict these sorts of weather events weeks ahead of time. Now, one source of predictability for the weather weeks ahead is the polar vortex, which forms up in the stratosphere. That's the second layer of Earth's atmosphere, each winter 10 to 50 kilometres over the pole. The polar vortex is a swirling mass of exceptionally cold air with winds moving west to east, so you can think of it a bit like a spinning top. During most winters, large waves down in the atmosphere below the polar vortex, that's the troposphere where we live, these waves can form and move upwards into the stratosphere. And they effectively knock the spinning top around when they get into the stratosphere and the waves can break there in a very similar way to waves breaking on a beach. Sometimes this wave breaking can be strong enough to completely break down the polar vortex or just knock the spinning top over and cause the mass of cold air to warm up rapidly. And when I say rapidly, we're talking about a temperature change of around 50 Celsius in just a few days. And, these, and, and the winds of the polar vortex reverse to easterlies at the same time. This tends to occur once every other winter in the Arctic and is called a Sudden Stratospheric Warming Event, or SSW. The first part of my PhD addresses ways in which these happen and how well we can predict them. Now, over the course of weeks to months after an SSW, the easterlies can descend through the stratosphere toward the surface, which can disrupt normal weather patterns. For us in the UK, this tends to mean a reduction in the strength of mild westerly winds and an increase in cold outbreaks from the continent. A classic example of this being the beast from the east in early 2018. The second part of my PhD addresses when and how these unusual weather patterns or regimes occur and whether we can predict them. Now, if we cast our mind back to that 2018 event, we actually found that weather forecast models did not predict the SSW more than about 12 days in advance. And in fact, up until that point, they were actually predicting the opposite situation, a very strong and stable polar vortex, a very stable spinning top. So the first thing we investigated was why and what could we learn from that? And we did this by analysing a large set of weather forecast model data. We found that a specific type of breaking wave in the northeast Atlantic, which we call the Scandinavia Greenland pattern because of its two centres of action, we found that this pattern was poorly predicted and largely responsible for the onset of the 2018 SSW and thus subsequently the beast from the east. We further found that this pattern was involved in driving previous SSWs over the past four decades and thus a key contributor to stratospheric variability. We subsequently found as well that current weather forecast models struggle to represent this pattern and struggle to predict it and its influence on the stratosphere, which then limits our ability to predict these sorts of major polar vortex disruptions and their subsequent impact on the weather we experience weeks ahead of time. As such, 
we urge that efforts should be made to improving how well forecast models capture this pattern in order to better predict these major stratospheric disruptions. And these results form two published papers. Next, and, and motivated by the time I spent working in the US, we diagnosed four large-scale recurrent weather patterns over North America and investigated how these are influenced by the strength of the polar vortex so that we can understand how extremes in the stratosphere relate to unusual weather we experience. We found significant observed differences in how likely three of the four patterns are when the polar vortex is strong or weak. For example, the Arctic high regime is seven times more likely to occur when the polar vortex is weak versus when it's strong. And these statistics that we found from observations can then be used to assess if weather forecast models are correctly capturing the effect of the stratosphere on the troposphere below. Crucially though, we found that the pattern most important for driving severe cold weather outbreaks over North America, that's the Alaskan Ridge regime, was likely not related to changes in the stratosphere. And that gives us a greater understanding of the role of the stratosphere, or the lack thereof, in driving these severe North American cold waves. Further recent work has involved changing the polar vortex strength interactively in a weather forecast model. And we've shown that improving the forecast of the stratospheric polar vortex can sub subsequently substantially increase the accuracy of weather forecasts over North America several weeks ahead. But we also found that we need to be able to better predict the state of the troposphere before these large changes occur in the stratosphere in order to maximize the accuracy of these forecasts. We've also been able to show which North American weather regime transitions are more likely to occur solely due to changes in the stratosphere, which will help in interpreting forecast uncertainty weeks ahead of time. Now, there are many highlights to my PhD, but here are just a few. Working at the National Weather Center in Oklahoma during summer 2019 was very special and probably the overall highlight of, of my three years. It directly shaped the overall structure of my PhD by focusing on analyzing North American weather. But it also gave me the opportunity to go storm chasing and to see several tornadoes and, and perhaps more importantly, to, to visit and collaborate with colleagues at places like NOAA in Colorado, which led to a few additional uh, research publications. Visiting Madrid for a conference uh, in late 2019 was also a highlight. I'd, I'd never been to Spain before. I was also able to appear on national news three times. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to do that. Uh, and just last year, I became co-editor in chief of the Royal Meteorological Society's Weather Journal, which is a, a real honor and something I would not have attained or, or been offered were it not for the supervision support and opportunities available to me as a PhD student at the University of Reading. Thank you. Our fourth and final finalist is Emily Pearson Weber from the Department of History, and she's representing the Heritage and Creativity Research theme. Emily's research explores masculinity and coal mining. I'm delighted to be nominated as the Heritage and Creativity Research Theme candidate. My research focuses on the experiences and representations of British mine workers from 1947, when the coal mines were nationalised, through to pit closures in the late 20th and early 21st century. I was drawn to this topic given my personal experiences growing up in South Yorkshire in the aftermath of the 1984 miners' strike in a landscape of increasing deindustrialisation. As a child, family members would point out the motionless headgear of the pits and the derelict steelworks, but I didn't understand the significance of these at the time. Through my research, I wanted to understand why the loss of the strike and the demise of the mining industry was felt so acutely by its workers and their communities. Narratives of the British mining industry often centre on the strike. This was an undoubtedly transformative moment as one of the most significant industrial disputes of the 20th century. And following this, the pit closure programme accelerated. Yet the industry and the men who worked in it were much more than the strike. My research aims to explore this through the experiences of miners and the material culture of mining communities. Undertaking research during the COVID-19 pandemic has been exceptionally challenging. Leading up to March 2020, I'd conducted 15 oral history interviews with the majority of these held in interviewees' homes. 
keen to continue my research despite the national lockdown, I circulated a call for Mining Memories, which was published in local newspapers, as well as on a number of relevant social media groups. Following this, I received an incredible response in the form of emails, letters, unpublished memoirs from former mine workers all across Great Britain. I conducted 27 interviews remotely over the telephone and via online meeting platforms. In total, I've interviewed 43 miners and I've also received testimonies from an additional 22 men. My oldest respondent was 93 and the youngest was 57. For over a century, coal mining was the backbone of British industry. It was also an exclusively male occupation with a unique homosocial culture, as since the Mines Act of 1842, women had been forbidden from working underground. Mining also had some of the highest levels of intergenerational continuity in Britain, and even in the late 20th century, many miners could claim a link to the industry extending back generations. This gave miners a strong attachment to the pit, as in his memoir of his 36-year career working in the North Staffordshire coalfield, George Shufflebotham recalled how, for most of us, it was a way of life, not a job. The pit was a harsh and dangerous environment, with vermin, dust, deafening noise, extreme temperatures and no sanitation. It was a well-known saying amongst miners that for every tonne of coal brought to the surface, a pint of blood was spilt, and great disasters were renowned in mining culture. My great-great-grandfather was killed in an explosion in Sengenid in 1917, leaving behind three young children. This explosion, which killed 440 workers, was the worst mining accident recorded in the United Kingdom. Increased mechanisation in the later 20th century changed the way in which coal was won underground, but mining remained a physically tough and dangerous job. In 1972, the Wilberforce report into the miners' pay dispute observed, other occupations have their dangers and inconveniences, but we know of none in which there is such a combination of dangers, health hazard and discomfort in working conditions. Through their labours, miners were framed as masculine heroes, both within pit culture and beyond. A number of my respondents voiced their appreciation for George Orwell's characterisation of miners in his 1936 work, The Road to Wigan Pier, in which he described the miner as a sort of grimy caryatid upon whose shoulders civilization rested and who performed an almost superhuman job. Such narratives of mining supermen were absorbed into mining culture and undoubtedly bolstered miners' self-image. The banners of the National Union of Mine Workers also celebrated the heroism of mine workers, showing them as champions of the working class. On the Kellingly Colliery Yorkshire area banner, which was paraded into the late 20th century, the miner appears as a Herculean figure, strangling the snake of capitalism, above a scroll with the instructive line, only the strong survive. In the later 20th century, the hostile environment of the pit offered a diversion from the predictability of modern life and required men to band together in order to survive. A number of my interviewees commented on the freedoms of the underground world, where there was foul language and no political correctness. In part, these freedoms were enhanced by the fact the pit was a place without women. As one of my interviewees explained, you could say things down there that you wouldn't say in a woman's company. For almost every man I spoke to, when asked what it was that was the best aspect of the industry and what it was they missed, they identified that it was the camaraderie or the relationship between men underground. The mining banners often emphasised the bond between workers with mottos like unity is strength and all men are brethren. Though union imagery and rhetoric celebrated the fellowship between mining men, for individual miners this bond was harder to articulate. In his 1980 published memoir of his time working in the pit, Harold Brown recalled, there is something down that pit amongst those men which defies description. The camaraderie underground was manifested through humour, which varied between schoolboy pranks to far more morbid comedy, yet Miner's performance of camaraderie could also be highly altruistic, which at its extremes would see men dying to save a colleague underground. The year-long miners' strike of 1984-85 had long-term consequences for the heroic image of the miner and the camaraderie they shared. During the strike, a number of pits continued to work, and this caused long-lasting division between miners that still sustains in many mining communities. As well as being discussed by my respondents, this shift was also depicted in the material culture produced during this period, which moved away from imagery showcasing miners' strength and instead emphasised his vulnerability and alienation. In the Hucknall branch banner, the miner is defenceless, kneeling with his back exposed to the policeman looming behind. 
In one particularly shocking image, a striking miner is shown hanging from a cross and beneath him working miners appear in uniform. Such pictorial representations captured the, the crisis experienced by some mining men. The bare-chested miner was no longer Herculean, but instead through the visual allusions to Christ, the miner appears as a martyr, betrayed by his friends. Following the failure of the strike, the industry contracted rapidly. By 1994, there were only 16 NCB pits and just 7,000 men left in the industry. The impact of pit closures was not just economically challenging for miners in their communities, it also threatened the identity of mining men. Many of my interviewees struggled to adapt to life outside of the pit, and in particular, the close fellowship shared between men underground. I was surprised that the identity of being a miner was one which the majority of my respondents not only passionately retained, but felt continued to define who they were. Men's continued identification as miners was especially remarkable considering most of the men I spoke with had been out of the industry for at least three decades and had moved on into a wide variety of other careers from law enforcement to adult social care. In my research, I've sought to understand how the masculine cultures of the pit helped to foster a strong sense of identity amongst its workers that men continue to embody even outside of the industry. The material I've gathered over the last year has been beyond my expectations and I'm extremely grateful to the men who have trusted me with their stories. I've been able to share my research at conferences, including at the University of Birmingham and at Northwestern University in the United States. I've recently had a piece accepted um, for publication in a peer reviewed journal, reflecting on my experiences conducting oral history interviews remotely, and I'm currently preparing another article for submission. Through my research, I hope to shed new light on the men who worked in one of Britain's greatest industries and make an important contribution to how we understand gendered experiences of deindustrialization. So many thanks to Emily and Simon. And it's now my great pleasure to hand over to Professor Dominic Zaum, one of our Pro Vice Chancellors for Research and Innovation, who's going to announce the winner of this year's PhD Researcher of the Year Award. Thank you, Diane. Being part of the panel reviewing the submissions for the Researcher of the Year Awards is one of the great pleasures of my role, and it has been a real privilege to be able to see your submissions again this year. You know, reading your submissions to the award highlighted to me again why you, Dr. Researchers, are so critical to the vibrancy of research in our departments, and why you're so critical to the future of your disciplines. In your research, you're breaking new ground at the frontiers of your disciplines, and I have learned a huge amount from the doctoral students that I have supervised over the last decade or so, and I know that many of my colleagues feel the same. Reviewing the submissions of the Research of the Year competition this year is really reassuring to see that the future of your disciplines in your hands is very much in safe hands. The doctoral research is often described as a lonely endeavour. But as with any successful project, it tends to have a team behind it. So I also want to thank those that are supporting these successes, in particular your supervisors and the graduate school. This year's submission to the Researcher of the Year competition were of extraordinary quality and made for a really difficult decision in the panel. Congratulations to all four shortlisted researchers. But in the end, all panel members agreed that the Doctoral Researcher of the Year Award 2021 should go to Simon Lee from the Department of Meteorology. Congratulations, Simon. So that brings us to the end of this year's conference. I really hope you enjoyed listening to all those presentations and viewing those interesting images. I want to say a big thank you to all of our speakers and also to our panels of judges. The Graduate School is really looking forward to next year's conference and we very much hope you'll be joining us and that we'll all be together in person.